one. Hello and welcome. This is our study of the Old Testament book of the prophet Isaiah, also known as the Gospel of the Old Testament. Today we're going to be looking at a passage that's often quoted around Christmas time. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 to 7. So I invite you to open your Bible to Isaiah 9 and your study guide to page 15, and we'll begin with a prayer. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time, this place, this occasion, and your presence with all of us. Lord, we are so grateful to have this house of worship where we can gather and uh, offer you our heartfelt praise, give you our full attention, and uh, Lord, I thank you for this cross behind me and the hands that made it. It's not just a decoration, but instead, Father, it's a vivid reminder that uh, Jesus went to the cross, that he suffered and died on our behalf so that we might be saved from our sins, that he became the child who was predicted here in Isaiah 9, who grew into a man and who offered himself as a substitute for all us sinners. In his name, in his memory, in his spirit, we gather here now and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we're going to look at, uh, this, as I say, this passage of chapter 9, but we're actually going to start in chapter 8, verse 22. Uh, this is the uh, final section of um, Isaiah speaking uh, woe against um, Assyria and then also a warning against Judah. And it culminates in chapter 8, in verse 22, Then they will look toward the earth, and they will see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom, and they will be thrust into utter darkness. Now, interestingly, in, the, uh, in one version, uh, ancient version of the Bible, the Masoretic text, uh, our chapter 9, verse 1, is actually chapter 8, verse 23. And so what that tells us is that these verses are so closely related uh, that it may or may not be a good place for a chapter break. So anyway, keep that in mind. We've, we've just talked about this, this completely gloomy picture, and now we go to chapter 9, verse 1, where it begins, Nevertheless, ah, a ray of hope, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun, and the land of Naphtali, but in the future he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by way of the sea along the Jordan. And this passage is going to continue uh, to use that theme of darkness versus light, but the, the, there is a very big contrast between the end of chapter 8 and the beginning of chapter 9. No more Gloom. Now the word nevertheless is, is what clues us into that contrast. Uh, look on your workbook, uh, again, page 15, and this contrast is borne out by the phrases utter darkness in chapter 8, verse 22, and no more gloom in chapter 9, verse 1. So chapter 8 ends in the very darkest prediction, and then chapter 9 begins with the most fantastic good news. So 
What is the land of Zebulun and Naphtali? Well, Zebulun and Naphtali are two of Jacob's sons, two of the tribes of Israel. They were part of the northern ten tribes that uh, were situated uh, when the nation of Israel split into two parts. The, the northern ten tribes became known as Israel, and the southern two tribes took the name of one of them, Judah. Um, so uh, there are various names in the Old Testament, and it helps just to keep them all straight. Um, so the land of Zebulun and Naphtali, it says they were humbled. Well, who humbled them? The king of Assyria, when he took them over. And uh, in the future, Isaiah says, he's going to, God will honor Galilee of the Gentiles. And that would include Gilead and southeast Syria. And so uh, these three areas that he's mentioning here are also three provinces that the Assyrians established after they had conquered that region of the world. So Isaiah is looking at a, a sort of a geographical, political picture here. And he's saying in the past, uh, these members of the alliance, and you remember from previous lessons that um, the alliance was between uh, Israel and Syria and the Arab allies to the south, and they all wanted to throw out the Assyrians, but of course, they didn't have the military power to do it. But when the book of Isaiah opened, um, that the, and we start hearing about the prophet and his historical situation, this was at a moment in history when the alliance had encamped around the city of, of Jerusalem. And so, especially in the first few chapters of Isaiah, we have to keep that picture in the back of our minds that it was a brother against brother and, and Israel against Judah, Israel and her allies uh, encamped around the city of Jerusalem. Now in verse 1 then, uh, Isaiah refers to their humiliation, but then he's also, God is also going to redeem them. He's going to honor them. Uh, the phrase, by way of the sea, uh, takes in the uh, Phoenicians and um, uh, the other nations that were involved in the, in the alliance along the Jordan. Now, Galilee of the Gentiles is a particularly important New Testament phrase. We'll take a quick look at Matthew uh, 21.11. And, and it becomes uh, an, a, a fulfillment of prophecy, actually, in Matthew 21.11, uh, where the crowd, speaking about Jesus as he entered into the city of Jerusalem in triumph, said... Uh, uh, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And so Matthew fixes uh, Jesus uh, living and growing up in Nazareth in the village, uh, or in the region, excuse me, a village in the re region of Galilee. And then Luke chapter 2, verse 39, does the same thing, but at an earlier part of Jesus' life. Um, uh, Matthew, or excuse me, Luke 2, I've got to get in the right chapter here first, and verse 39, when Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee and their own town of Nazareth. So both of those gospel verses uh, affirming that Jesus, uh, although he wasn't born there, lived in Galilee. And so that's the way God honored uh, Galilee of the Gentiles by arranging and orchestrating history so that 
uh, his son grew up there. The promised Messiah was from there. Let's go to verse 2. The people walking in darkness, and that goes back again to chapter 8, verse 22. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. So here's the contrast again between darkness and light. And um, those things are very rich biblical symbols. Darkness symbolizes ignorance. It symbolizes sin. It symbolizes judgment and condemnation. And it's described here in Isaiah 9-2 with the words gloom and distress and death. So you don't want to be in the dark and you don't, uh, you don't want especially to be in the, the place of outer darkness or utter darkness because as we observed last week, Jesus said that was the place where hypocrites uh, were cast. Light, on the other hand, symbolizes life, knowledge, righteousness. Light replaces darkness. Joy replaces death. Deliverance replaces oppression. So this is all good news here. That's why we call Isaiah the gospel of the Old Testament. This is good news. Now, on your page 15, there's a mistake. Uh, the question, why would God need reliable witnesses, is left over from a previous lesson. So just cross that off your book, please. That's where uh, a lack of careful editing will get you. Uh, so we'll go to verse 3. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. The people rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. Got a typo there on verse 3. It should read, how does the phrase, you have enlarged the nation, or what does that mean? Well, I think it's similar uh, oh, very similar to increased their joy. And this is by way of describing a, a, an, an era of peace and prosperity as signs of God's blessing. And you notice that the verse goes from farmers to soldiers, but all of them are joyful. And in those days, of course, a lot of people were farmers, very, very few people were soldiers. And so, pardon me, at the time of battle, uh, people often had to uh, be recruited from their fields to take up arms and fight against a national enemy. So Isaiah has that sort of encapsulated here in verse 3. Uh, he's saying there'll be prosperity and people will rejoice at the harvest. And, and then even in times of war, there will be victory and people will rejoice when dividing the plunder. Um, now, to our ears, uh, dividing the plunder sounds a little bit like being pirates, uh, that that's not a good thing. But um, as a matter of fact, uh, in the absence of a professional army, civilizations of the time would pay their soldiers by giving them plunder, by allowing them to loot the defeated enemy and carry off uh, the loot that they accumulated or accrued in that way. Uh, so uh, if a man was taken out of his field uh, and, he, and he couldn't produce a harvest, he has lost revenue. How is he going to replace it? Well, he'll replace it as a soldier and, and by means of the plunder 
that he took. So all of this serves as a, a hopeful note. Now, notice something about verse 3. It's written in the past tense. Normally, when you're making a prophecy or a prediction, you would use the future tense. You say, you will enlarge the nation. You will increase their joy. That would be the most obvious way to phrase it. But instead, Isaiah uses the past tense as if these things had already happened. But he does that for, uh, you might say, an artistic or um, a, a rhetorical reason, and that is to show the reader or the hearer uh, that this is so certain. This prophecy is so likely to come to pass that it's as if it's already happened. He's using it as a, as a literary device of sorts to say, uh, this is going to happen, but it's, I'm so certain it's going to happen, I'm talking about it as if it already has. Verse 4, for as in the day of, the, of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Now, what's this reference to Midian's defeat? Well, you may remember from the book of Judges, the story of Gideon and the opponents in that case were the Midianites, the, the soldiers from the nation of Midian who were attempting to invade Israel, or, yeah, Israel, who were uh, at that time was a united nation. Um, and so they were uh, looting, they were plundering, and God raised up a reluctant warrior named Gideon and used him to bring an end to this threat. And that's what the book of Judges is all about, that, that there would be, the, the people would lapse, that they would seek idols, God would bring discipline against them in the form of a foreign power, and uh, that they would cry out to God. God would raise up a judge, and that judge would lead them in military victory, and the threat would be eliminated. Now, that, there were cycles of that going on and on, and one of those cycles what involved this man, Gideon. Now, this is a very similar situation to what Isaiah was experiencing there in the city of Jerusalem with the alliance laying siege, the arm, their armies encamped about them. They wanted to take over Jerusalem so they could get Ahaz out of there and put in a puppet king who would become part of the alliance. Ahaz wisely, he was not a good king, but he was wise in the sense that he didn't think this alliance would succeed, and so he appealed to the uh, king of Assyria. Now this is re review, but I don't think it hurts uh, us to be reminded of that. So, similar situation, a vast army encamped against the people of God. And by the way, you can read uh, Judges chapters 6 to 8 to see um, the story of Gideon. Um, Gideon, as you may recall, or you will find out when you read it, uh, asked of God for a sign, and these two chapters, 7 and 8 of Isaiah, have been giving a sign in the form of a child or children's sons. Um, then uh, the emphasis back in Judges 6 to 8 is on God's deliverance, because you recall Gideon had raised up a pretty sizable army, but then God uh, whittled it down to just 300 men. So uh, the emphasis in both Isaiah and in Judges is God's deliverance and defeat of the enemy achieved by insufficient human means and massive divine intervention. <coughs> Pardon me. So, very similar situations, and that's why he refers to it here. What is the spiritual meaning 
of shattering the yoke, the bar, the rod. Well, uh, the yoke and the bar are very similar things. The rod would be um, uh, uh, the stick used to beat slaves to make them um, more compliant. So it, it means that, that God is going to lift off uh, the oppressive burden of the alliance and I think ultimately the Assyrians and then even further on the Babylonians. Let's go on to verse 5. Because there will be, as predicted in verse 4, a period of peace and prosperity, now in verse 5 we find out that the instruments of war are obsolete. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. So this fiery destruction of the implements of war causes rejoicing uh, because uh, this means that their enemy has been defeated, that they have been delivered, and the objects of war or things of an ordinary nature that were sullied by war are, are made obsolete because of peace, that the peace God provides will be so complete that they won't need to keep these things. They're ruined, they're bloodied, let's throw them away, Let's burn them. So this is similar to the promise given back in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4. He will judge between the nations and settle disputes for many peoples. That's peace. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation nor will they train for war anymore. The difference is, here in Isaiah 9, the objects of warfare are burned, they're destroyed, but back in Isaiah 2, uh, they're rehabilitated, they're remade, retooled, recycled, reused for instruments of peace. Um, is this a major theme in Isaiah? Yes, yes. It, it very much is. And so it, as we go through the books of, uh, the chapters of the book of Isaiah, we'll see this pop up again and again. Let's look at verses 9 and 7. Uh, the last two verses in this section. Um, we're taking a very short section today because of its importance. Uh, I wanted to, to put some specific attention on it. And then also... Uh, because if we had joined it to another section, it would have been just simply too long of a video, too long of a study. So let's look at this, and we'll, we'll take note of the particulars after we read them. Isaiah 9 and verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Those are some wonderful promises, aren't they? First of all, we have here a promise of a child, a son, and a uh, this is the child that is predicted, Emmanuel, in chapter 7, and um, also again in verse 8, uh, chapter 8, verse 8, excuse me, uh, chapter 7, 
uh, verse 14 and chapter 8, verse 8. Um, so the promise is made in chapter 7 and 8, and it is figuratively and literally delivered in uh, chapter 9. And there's some very similar language. We won't take time to read it, but just if you want, jot down these references. Jeremiah 2015 and Ruth 417. Jeremiah 2015 and Ruth chapter 4 verse 17. So it's, it's uh, I guess I'm pointing that out to say this is some um, typical language. It's not uh, like a formula that's recited to, to show an important birth. And in fact, some commentators look at these verses and they see the announcement of the ascension of a king to his throne. In ancient cultures, um, a king's birthday, quote unquote, was not the day he was born, but instead the day that he became king, the day that he ascended to the throne. And so it's, it's possible that the birth here is, is actually not uh, Christmas, um, but maybe you could argue um, the day of Jesus' ascension, where he goes back to heaven to the right hand of God the Father. So however you take it, it's not not particularly important point. Maybe both of them uh, can be understood as, as revealing uh, what's going on here. Um, and also, uh, I like the thing of a child and a son because it speaks to God's practice of using the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Jot down this reference, 1 Corinthians 1, 27 to 29. In 1 Corinthians 1, 27 to 29, Paul reminds the Corinthians that they weren't a big deal in this world and that God chose them to shame the people who were a big thing in the world and that he is constantly doing that so that people will realize that it's not their strength, it's his. It's not they who win the victory, it's God. It's like Gideon and his 300 men who could not have hoped to have won against thousands, but they did because God was with them. So a child, a son, it says here the government will be on his shoulders, and, and that's meant to evoke an image of a shepherd carrying a lamb across his shoulders. Uh, that's a picture of, of gentleness, of care. The lamb may be young or it may be injured, but for whatever reason, the shepherd is carrying it along. And in a sense, every king is supposed to be that gentle shepherd. It goes on to say, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. So thankfully, this is a prophecy of a time when government is not a burdensome thing. And uh, I'm sorry, but uh, my, my very deep-seated feeling is that um, in this nation, we've got too much government. You can d agree or disagree as you like, but government can certainly be a burdensome thing. And Isaiah's prediction here is that it won't be. It'll be a comforting thing. Uh, this child, this son, will reign on David's throne. That is, he'll be part of the dynasty of David. And because of that statement, some interpreters think that the child referenced here, that, that the immediate fulfillment of the prophecy is in Hezekiah or Josiah, who were kings later on in Judah. And you certainly wouldn't want to say that's impossible. It's very possible. But that still doesn't take away from the use of this prophecy as um, 
referring to the Messiah, referring to Jesus. And I think that's especially true as you look at the next two uh, clauses or phrases, establishing and upholding David's throne with justice and righteousness. How long? From that time on forever. And we know that the reigns of Hezekiah and Josiah both came to an end. Uh, and in fact, uh, the, the literal earthly dynasty of David came to an end when the Babylonians invaded and took over Jerusalem. Uh, there are four titles here for the child, the son. Uh, some commentators want to split wonderful and counselor into separate ones. Some translations may appear that way, but I don't think that's a good translation. These first three titles uh, emphasize the divine power of the child, of the son. The first is wonderful counselor, and I was amused to find out that this means wonderful planner or uh, wonder-making planner. So the word counselor there is not it really in the way that we would use it. We use the word counselor to refer to an attorney, and that's closer, but we also use it to refer to someone who um, performs therapeutic listening and gives advice, a psychologist or, or psychiatrist or sociologist, a counselor uh, who helps us with our mental and emotional health issues. This word is none of those meanings. It is uh, someone who um, is at work uh, to administrate. And that goes back to the two mentions of the word government. So this is a, a governor who is wonderful, a ruler who does wonderful things. That sounds very good, doesn't it? The next title, uh, the second one, is Mighty God. And in Ezekiel uh, 31, or excuse me, 32 verse 21, this same word is used to refer to mighty leaders. And um, in, uh, later on in Isaiah chapter 42 verse 13, it is the one to whom the remnant will return. So the picture here is of the divine warrior. And you should put those words in capital letters, capital D, capital W. It is a figure in the Old Testament that reoccurs uh, fairly often. And it refers to God who goes to war on behalf of his people. It's a, an image uh, that is ascribed to Emmanuel and it will be reaffirmed in Revelation, for example, in chapter 19 when Jesus is the rider on the white horse who has the sword coming out of his mouth, who slays the enemies of God. Page 16. The third title. Everlasting Father. Now here's um, where some people raise uh, a question of how can this be attributed to the Messiah, God the Son, and not to God the Father? Well, um, I think this is an authority figure. And though it may feel on a, like a superficial level that this is clouding the issue, really, it's just another way of saying that uh, the child, the son, will be a divine figure. Now this goes back also to chapter 1 verse 2 where God is depicted as the father who raised up Israel uh, as a son and who later became rebellious. So I think the, the emphasis here is on father in particular as a, an authority figure and again a comforting and yet competent and powerful authority figure. The fourth title I think relates more to purpose 
Prince of Peace. And again, this is the central theme of this passage and of much of Isaiah. Now, usually in the Old Testament, Prince is not so, as much a reference to the king's son as it is to a general who commands armies. Um, look at Genesis 21, 22. Um, and there, uh, the, the use of prince is to an army commander. And this is also used of God in Daniel chapter 8, verses 11 and 25. So those references again, Genesis 21, 22, and Daniel 8, 11, and 25. So these four names, as you take them together, give us a picture of uh, this child, this son, this Emmanuel, as being a divine figure, full of power, and yet not an oppressive power like the Assyrians. The final clause is that, the final sentence is that the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Now, why is that there? Well, first of all, the word zeal means that God is eager. The Lord wants to do this. It's very near the center of his hope and his concern and his desire to help his people. And so he's very eager for this to happen. And therefore, you can count on it being accomplished because the zeal of the Lord cannot be thwarted. God is going to accomplish what he promises. He will do all of it. If it were a human being, you'd say, well, maybe yes, maybe no. Because we've often seen in ourselves and in others, uh, we start out a project with a great deal of zeal, and then after time, adversity, or uh, just the sheer passage of time uh, causes our zeal to flag, and uh, we kind of lose our enthusiasm. That's not going to be the case here. The zeal of the Lord Almighty, the commander of heaven's armies, will accomplish this. So you can count on it. Now, just a quick question. How does this prophecy fit with the prophecy of Emmanuel in 7, 13 to 17? And then you can also add there chapter 8, verse 8. And... In both of those places, we have learned that a child is given as a sign. Now, a sign is a couple of things in the Bible. A sign is a miracle, and it is also a, a verification that a promise is being kept. And I think both of those are in play here. This chap ninth chapter um, is God saying, okay, we've talked about a child. Here comes this child, and here's what this child is going to be. Here's what this child is going to do. And whereas the present king, Ahaz, was evil and incompetent, and his um, miscues threatened to end the dynasty of David. Chapter 9 is a promise to God's people that God is going to establish that dynasty of David for all eternity. And he's going to do it in a way that produces unparalleled peace and prosperity. So go down your page 16 in the middle of the application section and I, and I ask you to explain the meaning of these passages from a 7th century B.C. A person who lived in Israel or someone who lived in Judah. And I think what we've just said is how they would have perceived that. Now, I've said in chapter 7, 8, and 9 
that because we have these prophecies of Emmanuel and we have these prophecies of the Son, that we're, we're eager to appropriate these and use them about Jesus. That's fine. But we need to be consistent in our method when we use the Bible. And the consistent method is to say, first of all, how was this used originally? What did this mean to the people who lived at that time? Was there a fulfillment in their time or in a later time, even before the birth of Jesus, before his ascension back into heaven? And to realize that these prophecies have layers of fulfillment and not just one. We're eager to use these uh, facility, or these passages about Christmas at Christmas time, but I think we need to uh, broaden our thinking and we need to be consistent. If we approached any other passage in Isaiah, the first question we'd ask is, what did this mean to Isaiah? What did this mean to those who heard his message? Because most of this was spoken. What did this mean to those who read his message once it was written down and then we get from that original meaning uh, an eternal principle and then we apply that principle to ourselves or to our own time so let's look for meanings that are immediate and then work our way through history now, the last question in the application section is, is there something we need to do next Christmas to better utilize this passage? And maybe what we need to do is to begin by setting the scene. Isaiah ministered at a time when the city of Jerusalem was surrounded by enemies. The people were afraid. And God gave them a message through Isaiah not to be afraid because he was going to supply them with a redeemer. He was before this child or this son was old enough to be weaned, before he was old enough to know the difference between right and wrong, their immediate situation was going to be relieved. And maybe we can identify with this passage a little better by understanding the original situation. And to them, Emmanuel meant redemption. It meant, he meant peace. And those are things that we would have said about Jesus, whether we knew the background or not. But maybe it takes on just a little bit more importance and has a little bit more emotional impact knowing the entire truth. God bless you in your continued study of Isaiah. And uh, next time we are going to get together, it'll be uh, lesson nine and we'll pick up starting in um, chapter nine, verse eight, continue into part of chapter 10 and what we're doing here is we're not going to we're not strictly observing the uh, chapter boundaries, but instead we're taking the uh, sections of subject matter and uh, studying them so that uh, um, we'll understand uh, the subject more than the chapter headings, which are not very important or chapter divisions, I should say. At any rate, God bless you. Thank you for being here.